Before we begin, would you please pray with me? Father, what a privilege to come before you in this thing we call prayer. Thank you that we get to communicate to you not only from our lips, uh, from our brains, but from the very core of our being. Thank you for guiding us. Thank you for being with us even when we don't feel you. Thank you for being here in this very service and helping the music and the stories and even as we linger looking into your word and considering other concepts. Thank you for using all of this that we might know you better, trust you more deeply, and have that peace and joy that only you can give. Thank you, Lord. We pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I think most of us would agree that teenagers have reputations. Oh, we're chuckling already. Come on, you know it. I'm looking into the eyes of many people who've already been through teenagehood. I look into the eyes of others who are still teenagers, and you know, you have a reputation, right? I know what many of you are thinking right now. What are they having for lunch? <laughs> so teenagers have a reputation to uh, consume vast amounts of food. Um, they have a reputation for asking questions that sometimes adults fumble with. And unfortunately, teenagers often, present company excluded, of course, have a reputation for doing what kinds of things? Yeah, you want to fill in the blank with words like foolish, risky, maybe even downright stupid. If I were to ask how many of us have done something stupid during our teenage years, if we were all on it, well, you keep your hands. Thank you for your honesty, though. That's cool. Um, I could have told many stories about myself, but I'm going to refrain from that. I'd rather talk about some stories that uh, easily give evidence to that reputation. Back in uh, oh, two, uh, 2008, and it kept escalating, finally started to die off around 2014, students, teenagers, were snorting Smarties at record levels. Snorting Smarties. Like, what's... Like, how did that happen? Was it after a Halloween thing and some high schooler came home and started unwrapping the Smarties and said, hey, you know, I think we can make this into powder. Yeah, and we could snort it. Yeah. That's risky behavior. Very risky. The sugar turns into shards, and it really irritates the nasal passages. It could get into the lungs. In fact... You'll really like this, and this will help you listen to the sermon better and put your appetite aside. Maggots can form in this nice, uh, sugary, liquid, dark environment. Scientifically proven. Please, Pastor, move on. I will. <laughs> I read about this 18-year-old Florida teen. I'm so glad that our storyteller encouraged the kids not to text and drive. It's also good not to drive recklessly. This teenager got behind the wheel of his car and he's just driving recklessly around Florida. Can't remember the city, but he's driving recklessly. He's running red lights. He's weaving in and out of traffic. He thinks this is a great time. Eventually he hits a car, bounces off of that, continues down the road, hits three cars that are waiting for a red light. And the accident, because he's going at such a, a velocity, it causes his car to really get crunched. He has to be extricated only with the jaws of life. He's taken unconscious in serious condition to the hospital. The doctors worked on him very well. So the next day, he, he wasn't doing too badly. In fact, the next day, a YouTube video showed up of his reckless driving. And that whole film, if you will, was taken by guess who? The driver. He was, he was filming the whole thing with his phone, laughing. And then he uploads it to YouTube which helped the police identify him. They were trying to figure out those accidents, and now they knew. You would agree with me that was a stupid thing. Now, admittedly, while 
teenage boys seem to have a little bit of an edge in the stupid department. Females aren't to be totally outdone, right? I read of some teenagers just starting to attend University of Georgia. And this one female posted a very interesting ad on Craigslist. I can read it for you. I am looking for someone to run my friend and I over with a car. This is true. This is not made up. We do not want to die. Oh, well, that. <laughs> some semblance of intelligence is left. We just want to be injured enough to get out of taking our finals. <laughs> you know the old saying, drastic times call for drastic measures. Yeah, you would agree, right? That, that was just dumb. But teens are not the only ones who do stupid things, right? Other stories of other human beings back this up. April of this year, a Modesto, California man in his 30s, definitely out of his teens, he runs out of gas, goes to a filling station, and he takes a random plastic jug, like an empty one-gallon milk jug, and he fills that up with gasoline, despite that there are many warnings posted all over the gas station on every pump not to do such an activity. So naturally, he goes to pour this in his gas tank, and he can't because his model car, like many of our cars, has this special nozzle. You can't just pour stuff into it, right? It has to be, there has to be an insertion of, of like a funnel-type device. And so he thinks, hey, this is plastic. I could reshape that. How do you reshape plastic? You use heat. How do you get heat? You get one of those lighters. Yeah, you know where that went. Yeah, he was badly burned, but he did survive. You're familiar with that higher-priced and higher-quality tool company called Snap-on, right? Snap-on tools. A guy named Buddy, definitely an adult, he buys a huge Snap-on roll-away toolbox. It costs him three grand, $3,000 for this toolbox. Two days later, because he has some overdue bills that are due like right now, he sells that same toolbox for $1,500, half price. He bought it on credit. He sold it for cash. He was able to pay his bills, except the snap-on bill for the $3,000. Yeah, they caught up to him. His wages are being garnished as we speak. Here's the young lady who, who buys a bottle of Coca-Cola. And at that time, when she bought this bottle, they were having a contest. Under, the, under several caps of the cola, you could see that you won a prize. Of course, the majority doesn't, but there are prizes under many of those caps. And she reads on the label of the Coca-Cola bottle that there is a winner every five minutes. So she buys the Coke, goes out to her car, and reading those words, she got very excited. She expected to win. And so she just sat there, and she waited five minutes, <laughs> and then was very disappointed <laughs> when she uncapped it, and there was no winning words under the cap. She had done what it said, right? Every five minutes, they lied to her until a friend explained it to her. On and on the stories go. I don't, I, teens are not the only one. Adults do it too. One of my favorites is the convenience store robber. He goes in, and he has his hand in the pocket, you know, with that gun look, and he tells the clerk behind the desk, Give me all the money you have. Take everything out of the register, put it in a bag. She get, immediately gets out this brown paper bag, puts money in it, and while she's doing that, he looks behind her, and on the shelves behind her are these pint and half pint bottles of liquor. So he points to a certain one. He says, and throw that bottle in there too. Throw a bottle of that in there too. Well, she had gathered just from his mannerisms and speech that he might not be the sharpest pencil in the box. So she says, sir, I'm sorry, I can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? Well, I can't. I don't, I don't know if you're 21 or not. I am 21. Put the bottle in there. Yeah, but I don't know. So, you know, I can lose my job. Please don't make me do that. I could lose my job. 
you know, you're free to come around the counter, come over the counter, get it, but I, I don't want to lose my job. I'll just stand over here. Give me the bottle. I'm, I don't want to risk my job, sir. He reaches in his pocket, pulls out his driver's license and slams it on the counter. Look! And she looks. Yeah, he's over 21. But she didn't just glance at his birth date. So she says, I'm sorry. She puts the bottle in there. He takes off. She immediately calls the police to share with them his name and address. And they were waiting for him at home. The truth is, probably without exception, all of us have done something stupid. Even the most brilliant of us has done a stupid thing from time to time. We could blame it on whatever, sleep deprivation, <laughs> like my x-ray department co-worker when I worked in x-ray at the Adventist Hospital in Chicago. My friend had worked two eight-hour shifts, took an eight-hour break, and then worked another eight-hour shift. That's a lot of hours in a short span of time, right? 24 within 32. And I happened to have him on that last shift. And I distinctly remember when the phone rang in our department, normally we would pick it up and say, X-ray library, can I help you? He picked it up and said, X-ray library, can you help me? <laughs> so we can blame it on sleep deprivation, a super headache, medication. One of my favorite activities, if I need a break in the day, is to put on YouTube and look up videos of people who have had their wisdom teeth pulled and had uh, nitrous oxide. Blame it on medication. Or just the plain fact that our brains are not perfect. The wiring isn't quite perfect. And it gets even more flawed from time to time. All of us, even the most brilliant, aren't immune from doing stupid things occasionally, right? Right? So we weren't just picking on teens. It's a human condition. But what if I were to ask you, what is the stupidest thing a human being can do? Is there such a thing? Is there actually the stupidest thing a person could do? As I thought about that, to me the stupidest thing any of us can do is to ignore all the God promptings we have. The God promptings he puts around us, he puts in us, above us. Ecclesiastes 3.11 states, he, God, has put eternity into the hearts of men. I think the writer is telling us that inside each human being, deep in our innermost core, God has placed this sense of our divine roots, our divine origin, this notion that we came from an eternally existent personal creator who made us with the express purpose of living in his face-to-face -face presence amid a flawless environment of total harmony. You've sensed it. You've sensed it. I've sensed it. Because God, as one theologian said, is like the hound of heaven. He dogs us. He will never manipulate our will, but he will constantly plead with us to know him. To some degree, I think the movie The Matrix one of my favorite movies, portrays how we humans sense and ponder our real purpose. How we sense and ponder our real purpose. When we unshackle ourselves from all the technology and all the responsibilities that suck our attention in, kind of like a black hole in outer space, sucks in stars and every other matter around it. When we stop long enough, that's why God pleads with us in Psalm 46, be still. That's not just slow down, pause a tiny bit. Be still and know, meaning experience, that I am God. Yes, I think when we're alone in the quietness of our souls, we ask questions like, could what we call stars and planets and earth and life as we know it could it all have just come into being by chance and elements that somehow have always existed? What is God really like if he does exist? What if that God is the God depicted in the Bible? If a divine personal intelligence is responsible for life, 
then what is that being like? If the God of the Bible is truly a God of limitless love and limitless power, then why am I surrounded by evil and by suffering and by death? Even death of people seemingly good people, innocent people, or people I love. I think to deny these and other related questions is to lie to ourselves. We're not being honest with ourselves. To believe Christian teachings without evidence, I think, could be very spiritually, intellectually irresponsible. In fact, I wonder how much faith one can have without tackling the questions surrounding the teachings of the Bible. I'm talking about good, open-hearted, open-minded, questioning, honest searching. We all have questions, and with those questions come doubt. Doubt in some form. We try to deny it sometimes. We think God condemns it sometimes, but we all experience doubt at least at one time or another. I want to ponder this experience we call doubt. Which, by the way, I think, as we discussed in my Bible class, could be a stepping stone towards actually knowing absolute truth. And we know absolute truth exists, right? Because for somebody to say everything is relative is to make a statement of absolute, right? So it's, it's circular logic. To say that there is absolutely no absolute truth is to state an absolute that at least the speaker thinks is truth, right? Anyway, back to exploring doubt. We've heard this word skeptic, right? You've heard the word skeptic. Maybe you've used the word skeptic. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, a skeptic is a person who doubts the truth or value of an idea or a belief. What's interesting is that the original word for the word skeptic, we get it from the Greek, skeptikos, it meant inquirer. That's what it really meant, an inquirer. The meaning is not someone who disbelieves and then rests in that disbelief, but rather of someone who has doubts about an idea or a belief and looks further into the matter before drawing a conclusion. Got any skeptics out there? God, throughout the Bible, addresses this idea of skepticism. I believe Paul was inspired to write this. Don't despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good and abstain from every form of evil. Test everything. Is there a Christian belief? Is there an Adventist belief that you have a problem with? What's brought you to that problem? What are you doing to solve it, to answer it with something more concrete? How does God treat doubt? I want us to look at some Bible passages here very quickly. Think of the book of John in chapter 1. You've got these disciples of John the Baptist who are looking at Jesus and they're like, where are you going? They're really saying, what are you about? We want to find out. And what does he do? He invites them to examine. Come and see, he says. And that phrase catches on and other Bible other disciples actually share that with one another. They invite others. Come and see. Examine. Do your research. One of my favorite Bible texts, John 7, 24. Don't judge by mere appearance. Do yourself a favor. Look beyond mere appearance. Make a right judgment. When John the baptizer was in prison, we read there in Matthew 11, he expresses some doubt, doesn't he? He's in prison. He's languishing in prison he had been the first to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. He's the long-awaited Savior of the world, and now he's in a prison. It's not looking good for him. It's looking fairly grim, and yet Jesus is out there not helping him out. So he asks his disciples, go and ask him if he's the one, or should we wait for another? Does Jesus, when those disciples of John come to him, does Jesus say, you go tell John to get his act together? You tell him he's, he's got to buck up, put his big faith pants on. That's not what Jesus says. He says, tell John about the things I'm doing. And to paraphrase a bit, how what I'm doing correlates to all these prophecies about the Messiah 
and he will be able to see more and more how what I'm doing and what the Bible, what the Old Testament says the Messiah would do, they gel, they coincide. And we have John chapter 20 also. Jesus doesn't condemn Thomas. You remember Jesus appeared to the disciples, but Judas was missing because he had offed himself, right? And Thomas was missing, and we don't know why, but Jesus comes there in the evening of the day of the resurrection. That must have been one cool meeting. But Thomas isn't there. And when the disciples tell Thomas, who arrives later, hey, Jesus has been with us. We talked with him. We fellowshiped with him. We ate with him. He says, oh, I can't believe that. Not until I take my finger and put it in the, in the nail wounds in his hands. And not until I take my hand and put it in the spear wound in his side. And one week later, Jesus shows up. And the first thing he says is, peace be to all of you. And then he looks at Thomas. He singles him out. And he says, Thomas, here I am. Here's my hand. Go ahead, put your finger through that hole. Here's my side, Thomas. You can put your hand there. He doesn't rebuke him. By the way, we call Thomas the doubter. Please realize he was the only one who, when Jesus said he's going to go to Jerusalem and be crucified and die, it was Thomas who looked at the other disciples and said, let's go with him so we can die with him. That was Thomas. So don't just label him by that one story. Remember his whole life, right? I don't think anybody here would want their reputation staked on just one event in their life, especially one of their flawed events. So Jesus doesn't rebuke him. He just says, you need a little more evidence to urge you to more faith? I'll give it to you. That's the way God treats us. Finally, we read about the Great Commission in Matthew 28. But before that, the Bible says, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Did he chase them away? Hey, you guys aren't privy to watch me ascend to hear my final words. Go get your faith act together. No. Some doubted. He didn't chase them away. He said, nobody who comes to me will I cast away. So we don't need to feel shame because we have doubts. They could be springboards to further research and greater faith. What we do with doubt could be negative, but doubt itself is not necessarily negative. If I have a doctor give me a diagnosis I don't like, I could say, you know what, I don't like that diagnosis. I'm not going to believe it. There you go. Am I better off? Probably not. But if I say, you know, I doubt that, and that doubt prompts me to get a second opinion, either I get confirmation or I get something else. Maybe I find out I don't have it after all, but I have more validation. Doubt alone isn't negative. It's what we do with it. So what about the realm of faith in God and the Bible? Well, I would say we do not have to kiss our brains goodbye to believe in God or to believe in the other teachings of the Bible. I like what Winston Churchill said. I like this statement he makes. Men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing ever happened. Think of that when it comes to the Bible. Think of that when it comes to faith in God and what's at stake. I urge all of us, wherever we are in our faith journeys, to check out the validity of the Bible. Do we have credible evidence that this isn't merely of a human design? I think we do. We can look at its origins, the lives of its writers, the incredible prophecies, archaeological validations. God gave us enough evidence to exercise faith. What about the story of Jesus? Do we have enough credible evidence that he actually lived in Jerusalem and existed? Yes. We have writers and historians, not only who were believers, but some who were not believers, but they wrote and testify of his existence and his acts as well. What about the claim he rose from the dead? This is probably my favorite. Do we have credible evidence that he truly died and literally rose from being dead? Yes. Check out the many people, intelligent people, brilliant people, who have examined that. Some of them with the sole purpose of disproving the resurrection and watching Christianity collapse like a house of cards, and yet they became believers. We could read of many of them, perhaps my favorites, 
Simon Greenleaf. He is the professor who put the Harvard School of Law on the map, so to speak, gave it its popularity. He wrote an incredible three-volume work entitled A Treatise on Law and Evidence, which, by the way, you could buy on Amazon. It's still in circulation and used today to teach attorneys. At one time, when he described himself as a non-believer, he was challenged by one of his students to use the principles he, he espouses in those three volumes and to use them to examine the evidence for Christ's resurrection. And he did so gleefully, happily. He said, I am going to take Christianity down. Well, at the end of his research, he wrote another book. It wasn't the one he had planned on. It was called Testimony of the Evangelists because he himself had concluded there's hardly a thing on this planet more verifiable than the resurrection of Christ. I could tell you of many others, but I'll leave you with this one and wrap it up. Lee Strobel. I come from Chicago. And what helps endear me to Trent's heart is when he has the jazz band they play, Sweet Home, Chicago. Chicago, this newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, famous newspaper, Lee Strobel, for quite a while was not only an investigative reporter for them, but he was an award-winning investigative reporter. He helped to solve crime cases in Chicago that the officers were having, the, the uh, law enforcement investigators were having a hard time solving. He won awards for this. He had gone to law school, but he didn't pursue being an attorney. He became an investigative reporter. His wife winds up to be a believer. They were both atheists, but she winds up to become a believer, and he's like, wait a minute, either you're right and I'm wrong, or I'm right and you're wrong. I'm going to use all of my prowess, all of my skill, all of my knowledge on the topic of investigating evidence, and I am going to show you where you're wrong. And so Lee Strobel sets out to do just that. And what is the result? A book, and now a movie, called The Case for Christ. And how humorous. He actually becomes a pastor at his wife's church, Willow Creek Church there in the Chicago area. Honestly, nobody could absolutely prove the existence of God or the Bible, but neither can anybody absolutely prove the non-existence of God or that the Bible is not divine, divinely sourced. We owe it to ourselves to be intellectually honest with ourselves. At worst, we will have found out that we're mere pieces of earth that live by the dictates of non-personal matter. There's no real choice in life. At best, we will have found that a personal, beyond our imagination, God lives and caringly oversees our lives, seeking to persuade us to know him, to trust him, and accept his gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And we may come to know and experience something that the prophet Jeremiah wrote God told him to put this down and tell Israel at a very tumultuous time in their history. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Don't, don't lose this. You will seek me, and you will find me. When you search for me, seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. In our sense, the captivity of unbelief and doubt. And he helps us to live with assurance and security and joy. I believe that. So at the very least, I encourage ourselves to be honest with ourselves and to reap the benefit. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being with us. Thank you for gracing us with so many things in life. I think of right now music. What a blessing. And thank you for these young people and their supervisors who help them be able to put on a performance like this that in some cases just ushers us into your throne room through our imaginations and by the notes of this music. Thank you for your word. Thank you for all the evidence you have given us to bring us to a place of faith where we can actually believe things that seem impossible or irrational because we have so much rational, verifiable evidence behind us. Help us, Lord, to know you and to trust you more.
Thank you for guiding our lives. Thank you for the fellowship and the luncheon that's about to take place. May you be our unseen guest there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.